You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I started speaking to the guy and he just stood up and he shot the platoon sergeant. And as he stood up, you know, I shot him, I think I shot him twice in the stomach and three times in the chest. And he just went against the wall and then a firefight started with the rest of them. They had a machine gun there and they were laying in tears. And <coughs> I was against the wall shooting and I could hear a crack in between my legs. I never thought any more about it. Anyway, the, the contact finished early in the morning. We'd got the guys and got bodies and whatnot. And I went back to the place where I'd shot this guy. And what it was was a hand grenade that landed between my legs and cracked open. It was the old Mills grenade, the 36. And uh, it cracked open and only the detonator had gone off. What was it like, Peter, to kill a man for the first time? It was nothing to do with, I've killed somebody. It was to do with, I haven't let my instructors down. I haven't let my comrades down. I remember one guy was hanging over a bush, holding the bush, and his brains were blown out, you know, from the back. He'd been shot in the back of the head. And it made a terrible impression on me. And I looked and I went, I couldn't believe that soldiers could do that to their fellow soldiers. I took a, a grenade and I pulled the pin out and I had a, a, a submachine gun. And I just held it in one hand. And the guys came up closer and closer. And it's, he didn't see me, and I stuck a machine gun in his hand, in his stomach. Dave then came up to uh, Hereford. I met him in one of the pubs there, and he, he says, I've got a job. I says, what is it? He says, um, kill Pablo Escobar. And I went, let's go for it, you know. <laughs> Boom, we're on. Okay. And today's guest, we've got SES hero, Peter McAleese. How are you, Peter? Good, thank you very much. And thank you, it was good to meet you. Yeah, likewise, it's um, seen your documentary. You were hired by a rival cartel from Escobar yeah. to go and kill him. Yeah. Mad story, Escobar, I think he was supplying 80% of the world with cocaine. One of the biggest, probably the number one most biggest villain yeah. on the planet. One of the richest as well, I think it was worth about 30 billion. Yeah. But you um, were chosen to kill him, basically. Yeah. It's a mad, mad story, which we'll touch on. But Glasgow guy as well. <laughs> Scottish, <laughs> typical fucking Scottish nutcase, I think we've got here. You've um, been all around the world as well, Peter. Yes. But SES trained and there's no fucking about with you. Some of your videos I've watched in the past, it looked as yeah. if I'm not going to fuck with that guy. But first of all, how are you, Peter? Fantastic. Good. Great. Life good? As, as good as can be. Yeah. How are you dealing with the attention after the documentary release? It sometimes gets a bit much, you know, um, but I can handle it, you know. Mm -hmm. And you've got a book out, No Mean Soldier? The book is No Mean Soldier. Which we'll plug straight away. That's there. Um, so people, we'll leave the link in that to the description for Peter's book. Give it a read, yeah. man. It's a phenomenal read. Yeah. So... I always go back to the start with my guest, Peter. Where you grew up and how it all began. Well, I, grew, I was born in Shettleston. And then, you know, it was after the war and we'd know, nowhere to live. And we, then we went to live with my grandparents in Carntine. And we, my grandfather found an old building that belonged to Berlinay Prison. And it was... You know, the people, it was empty. So ourselves and a number of other people, we just went there and squatted in the building for the best part of eight years. Uh, they tried to evict us. I was in jail when I was four. <laughs> they tried to jail us, a few, uh, jail us a few times, you know. And um, it was funny. Um, it was, the people there were fantastic, but it was, it was one slum in the middle of a fairly posh district because Ridley was fairly Ridley at that time was fairly posh, you know. Mm -hmm. How was your schooling, Peter? Fantastic. I had a great schooling. 
I went to St Thomas's School in Ridbury, run by nuns, very, very strict. But, you know, they were interested in you, you know, and they, they wanted good scholars. Was there many beatings or anything with that kind um, of stuff back in the day? Yes, yeah, so I went back to uh, my school about 20 years ago and I stood in the schoolyard and I burst out crying. And it was just, it brought back memories to me of the school, you know, and my mates, I was in the football team. And then a nun came out to see me. She says, can I help you, sir? I says, yes, I, I, I used to go to the school and I'm just visiting. She says, come into my office, have a cup of tea. She, she made me some tea. And um, we... Uh, <coughs> We sat there and she brought out a big ledger and she went through all the family names. My Auntie Jane had been there, my brother had been there, what years we'd attended. Then she asked me about what nuns were there when I was there. I said, Sister Vincent and Sister Loyola. And she said, and she laughed. She said, if Sister Loyola was still alive, she'd be hard up at the, the Hague for infringement of human rights. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um it was a good school. I really enjoyed it. How was um, your relationship with the parents, mum and dad? It was strained. Uh, my mother tried her best. My dad probably in his own way tried his best, but he didn't know how to. Um, he solved every problem by beating you. You got a beating first and then the inquiry came later. It was just the way it was. It wasn't just my dad. It was a number of people in Glasgow at the same time had that thought pattern. Yeah, was your dad in prison? That was he in Berlin or something? My dad got locked up in Berlin, and he was his cell overlooked the building that we lived in. Mm -hmm. And my mother would say, "Peter, go out and see your dad's window." And he used to put different colours in the window, which told my mother how he was feeling. He was depressed, or he loved her. It was a little code they had between the two of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd co I'd come back and say it's red or it's blue, and my mum would sort of be happier depressed based on that it's my I've been in Berlin as well my, I was in, I ended up in uh, D Hall but my mum and dad they used to bring my dog up see after and they used to bring my dog up and used to like show me because I'd just got a dog at the time before yeah. I got to jail uh, it was a boxer and I was in D Hall but you could see right out to the car yeah. park and they used to bring the dog out to run about for 10 minutes it was nuts <laughs> it was uh, just to see the dog I got arrested there once in the I came back for Rhodesia and leave and they got me for something that I'd done before I went to Rhodesia. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it was a bit of a sick joke. You know, the judge was there with a the sort of glasses on the bottom of the face. What record? Does this man have a what record? And he says, uh, the lawyer said, yes, uh, he's a sergeant in the Rhodesian army and he's home in leave. Rhodesian army, Rhodesian army. When is he, when does he due to go back? He says the 26th of August. Remanded in custody to the 26th of August. So I spent my whole leave in Berlin. Mm. And the best of it was, all the guys had been to school, we were in there. <laughs> <laughs> what was that like for you being in the jail, Peter? Um, it was, wasn't some that... I just looked at it. I, I think what annoyed me most was coming home and leave. And losing it, can you see it? Mm -hmm. And uh, as I say, I, I, I came out of jail and I headed straight back to Rhodesia. Um, I was working for the a guy called Mike McGuinness who ran part of the special branch and he sent the money across to get my fare because I, my ticket had run out. So, um, and I got back to back to Rhodesia and he just, he just said get on with your work where is Rhodesia? well it's Zimbabwe now is that? aye mm -hmm. and uh, you know at that time it was called Rhodesia it was a transition period it became Zimbabwe Rhodesia first and then they dropped the Rhodesia off for a, a little while it was called Southern Rhodesia again which was the original original name of the the colony and then they dropped that and it was became Zimbabwe mm -hmm. What age did you first join the army? Was it 16, Peter? No, I was 17. 17? Aye. What made you join? Um, I'd run away from home and I, I was working in Aberdeen on the docks. And uh, 
the guy that I used to work with had been an RSM. And he said, son, get yourself in the army. And he impressed me. And um, I went to the uh, recruiting office in Market Street in Aberdeen. And I joined the army. The guy tried to get me to join the Gordon Highlanders, which was a local regiment. And I said, no, I wanted to go to the Paris. And he said, OK. And I joined on Monday morning. And on Friday, I was an older shot. None of the six-month stuff that you got today. I joined on the Monday and I landed an older shot on a Friday. What did you run away for, Peter? My dad. What was that? Were you scared I... of your dad? At that time, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And was that a relief for you, just trying to get away? Would you have done anything to get away? No, I just had enough of it. You know, mm -hmm. it, was, it wasn't pleasant. You know, you, you, it just... He didn't know any better. You know, and it, it, it just... You know, you felt as if we were at fault because we were born, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> what was older shot like? Young kid, 17. Oh, was that uh, your first time out of Scotland? I, I was in the train. And uh, is it okay to swear? Of course it is. I, uh, there was a, when I went down the train, there was a Scotland and England match uh, taking place down at Wembley. And the train stopped and there was this guy running up and down the station with a big Scottish flag going, you English bastards, English bastards, and we were in Castairs. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I found it really funny. Mm. I arrived in Aldershot, and Aldershot's a very, it's a doer town. Well, it was to me. And uh, I got there and I arrived at the Parachute Regiment Depot and I walked in there and it was, you know, I just felt, this is great. Everybody was smart. Everything was done properly. Um, and I joined, I get squadded in a platoon. And I feel I must talk about this. Um, there was a corporal came along and she said, hey, hello son, how are you? And he, he started teaching me to fold my kit and, you know, get your locker right, that your toothpaste goes there, your soap goes there, your toothbrush goes there, you know, so and so. And her, he was very, very how could have been helpful to me and kind? And I wrote to my mother, and I wrote this letter back, Mummy, you sort of thing. The corporal's my best pal. Anyway, the corporal told us, and he said, we'll begin, we're beginning training on Monday morning. And the corporal, who's my best pal, opened the door and threw a fucking dustbin right down the middle of the floor and started screaming. <laughs> we were all in a state of semi-hysteria. <laughs> and that went on for about 10 weeks. Um, you were just changing into PT kit, get get into drill kit, get this, get and it was just you never you never had a minute to yourself. You know, you just put your head in the pillow and then you're gone. <laughs> what was the training like then? It, it it was it was good. It was good. Um firm, very firm. Um and the standard instruction was good. Uh and I was very fortunate. In the platoon I was in, there was two old soldiers and they used to help us out quite a bit. If you were struggling with something, they would help you. Was it good then? Did you enjoy it? Was, or were you homesick at any point? No. Nah. Homesick was... Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was the last thing I thought about was home. I just enjoyed it. Uh, you were getting... You know, you... Although it was strict, it was bearable. Can you, can you see that? Yeah. And you, you could see yourself. You know, you'd go in the drill square... And there was noise, you know, they'd call your attention to your dig, 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 you know, guys coming to your attention at a different time. And at the end, you could just hear it all click, you know, just to get a bang. Mm -hmm. And then you, you march and you all, you all had that sort of swagger of confidence. This is over 10 weeks. And you, you started feeling proud of how far you'd come. There's people quitting, walking out, oh, those, I, There was an awful lot of people quit. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys get binned. Um, but we finished up and uh, we went to continuation to, to Abingdon first, and that was that was like being in paradise because it was a difference in fighting for your food and getting it served to you. You can see it was an RAF camp mm -hmm. where we did the parachute course, and the food there was outstanding. Uh, then we came back, and then then it started really picking up. You were learning. We did continuation training. 
And at the end of the continuation training, we did a parachute do- jump, the whole platoon, and we did a, a parachute exercise. And I, I, I found it. I just felt I was home. What was it like doing your first parachute jump? Um, I still don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 it was funny. I spoke to one of the instructors. You know how you're, you're only young and you're going, what likes it to parachute? You know, so mm-hmm. and so and so and so. And one of them said, son, it's the only time in your life you're going to defecate, urinate, and ejaculate at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I need to give myself a parachute then, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Where was the first time you went into a kind of battle, Peter? Um, Where did you go and how old were you? I was in Cyprus, that was in 64. Um, and we got bushwhacked uh, on a road. And we we got we, we just drove out of it. And that was the first time I'd actually been shot at. And then I went to the SAS and uh, and I had um, I'd done an Arabic course by this time. And we were coming down a wadi, which is a steep embankment type thing. And um, the, platoon, the troop sergeant came up to me and said, there's some Arabs there. And I looked and I went, now, we'd met a guy beforehand, and he was shouting. I said, Uskut, Uskut, be quiet. And uh, and we went further down. We didn't realise this guy was a lookout for the group, and he'd been shouting to wake them up. So we got there, and we were still sleeping. And I just said, this doesn't look right. You know, there was lying in a straight line. And um, I started speaking to the guy, and he just stood up, and he shot the platoon sergeant. And as he stood up, you know, I shot him, I think I shot him twice in the stomach and three times in the chest. And he just went against the wall and then a firefight started with the rest of them. They had a machine gun there and they were laying in tears. And <coughs> I was against the wall shooting and I could hear a crack in between my legs. I never thought any more about it. Anyway, the, the contact finished early in the morning. We'd got the guys and got bodies and whatnot and I went back to the place where I'd shot this guy and what it was was a hand grenade that landed between my legs and cracked open it was the old Mills grenade the 36 and uh, it cracked open and only the detonator had gone off and I went that was a close one you know especially in between my legs you know what was it like Peter to kill a man for the first time it was nothing to do with I've killed somebody it was to do with I haven't let my instructors down. I haven't let my comrades down. Can you see it? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you get these, the movie image of it, you know, and I, j- I can only tell you what it, what it was like for me. Um, I just knew that I'd prove myself in battle and I, I felt there was an elephant, uh, uh, sorry, uh, an element of confidence there. Did you sleep okay that night after that? Oh, it's never bothered me, you know. I've never had that type of thing. Um, I've only had it once and it was just in passing, you know. What was that like for the first time then, being in conflict, grenades, bullets? Did that uh, excite you, Peter, or was it oh, scary? It, it was It was exciting. And, you know, because I saw everything coming together. You know, we two guys wounded. We'd killed five of them. The two wounded men, we saw the Air Force coming in. They couldn't pick them up because they thought the sides of the wadi were too steep. Then the Navy pilots came in and we got the two guys out. You know, I could see how the whole thing worked. There was aircraft up above, you know, getting ready to put a strike in should there be any more skirmishes. And uh, I saw the whole thing being coordinated and coming together, which was exciting. How old were you then? Uh, 22. And this is when you were in the SAS? Yeah. What was SAS training like then, Peter, in the 60s? It was fantastic. <laughs> oh, honestly, it was... Uh, How long did it last? Well, I, I did one of the longer courses, and it lasted for seven months. The idea being that they were trying to train us up to squadron level so as we could go and join the squadron and be already be trained up without doing courses in the squadron. And... Uh, the, the imagination that was used in the exercises. You know, for example, there was one exercise there where we had to meet agents. 
and they said, you better watch it. This season's drunk, so you're going to have to pump him to get information out of him. And I can remember the guy's name, it was Pete May. And he was drunk. They actually, they actually let him get drunk, so you, you had the realism of trying to get information out of him, and he was stuttering and whatnot, you know. And then he put us on to another agent, and then we had to go and blow up a dam. And then we we went to a third uh, RV, and the agent, the guy who worked for us, was hanging. Was just, yeah, we walked through the door. It was like something that a movie. There was a full moon, <laughs> and the stiff was hanging from the ceiling, just turning, turning around slowly, and uh, it, it couldn't have been more realistic. Then, <clears throat> excuse me, we moved off, and we. We were told to be picked up by a submarine, submarine round about the um, Aberystwyth area. So we made our way there, and that was the, the end of the exercise. And I tallied up the miles. We'd marched 80 miles on that exercise. But it was broken up, and can you see it? There was mm -hmm. Stages? Know, it was, yeah, it was fantastic. How many people started that course, Peter, to then? Who finished? How many finished? Um, there was 32 started it. It was a winter course I did, and there was four past. Um, and it, it was a great feeling, you know. You, you know, you could see it, people leaving and whatnot. And uh, I just, I felt extremely proud, you know. Yeah. What makes somebody pass those courses? What What is it that? Who, what's the is a, the four who passed? Is the, have they all got something the same? Where obviously you've got that no quit mentality. You've got to be kind of fucked up as well to go yeah. through that kind of torment, yeah. torture. But what is the ingredient there for the four people to pass? Is it? Well, I can really only speak for myself, uh -huh. but there was a couple of guys there who were really switched on, and they were intelligent. Um, one of them came from Two Para, another one came from the Gloucesters, and there was one who was a recourse. Um, and we all had the same aim in mind. We wanted to join the SAS, you know. What is the SAS, Peter, for people who don't know? It's a regiment that was formed in World War Two. 1941, was it? Yeah. Um, it was formed by a guy called David Sterling. Uh, SAS stands for Special Air Service. And, um... They did an awful lot of raiding behind the enemy lines along with the Long Range Desert Group in World War Two. Then they got involved in Europe and finally in France, Germany and they worked those areas. They were disbanded in 1945 and they were reformed in 4950 and they became, it was a, a territorial unit by then, and it became the Malian Scouts and uh, which became the SAS. Mm -hmm. So you territorial, Malayan Scouts, SAS, and then the SAS, the SAS was the final name. Tough bastards, aren't they? Like I've spoke to people who's kind of done the courses. and the, the, What do you think? Do you know what goes on in the courses now to when it was like 40 years ago? Uh, you, you, is it the different? Big, the big thing is, guys got on about it wasn't like that when I was in, you know, when we did the log race, we did it with a log each. It's, you know, it never gets better. Mm -hmm. But what I do see is some of these young guys that's come in just now, no matter how hard you made it, they would make it. So it's no use saying we were tougher than them. And the other thing is, the standard of training now has improved an awful lot. You know, and the, there's more depth to it. Um, there were certain weaknesses in the SAS when I got there. And uh, like the issue in the extraction of orders, um, now the guys are, some of the guys are outstanding at it, you know. Mm -hmm. What was it like then for, to pass that course? You've been in Russia, yeah. Colombia, you've been all over the world. What was your, what was the, the path she's went after you passed the course, Peter? We, I then went to, I did some time in Aden. I did some time in Borneo and we moved between Aden Borneo and the UK, we used to come back to the UK for retraining. So you do language courses, demolitions courses, medics courses, uh, then you'd start the circuit again. 
Did you feel confident in any war zone you went in that you were going to be victorious? Or did you always feel that you were elite? Like, see, after the seven months training, did you feel yeah. totally different? Was oh, yeah, everything yeah, I, sharper? I, I felt a confidence within myself. But that was that's down to the instructors. I mean, they really put an awful lot of work into us. Um, and I was blessed. I had good instructors on my course. How hard is it to lose people, Peter, when you going through these kind of courses? Or when you're in the war zones and you see people getting killed, friends of yours, is that difficult? Does that fuel you to, to keep fighting? Or does it ever question it, okay, enough's enough? No, I, I've never felt like that. Um... When I saw a dead guy who was one of my comrades, I'd say that could have been me. But it never went any deeper than that. Of course, you you, you never thought it, about it much at the time because you were fighting. And then it would come along after it, you know, when you went to the funeral and you get memories of the guy, you know. Because a lot of people struggle with PTSD when it gets into battle and stuff and um, they really struggle. Did you ever battle yourself, Peter? No, it's never. I've never had a problem like that. I I don't have trouble recognising PTSD. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. What I'm saying is it can get your pension in the army now and I, I feel that a few people might think that their army service was a lot harder than it was. And it's quite it's quite common. I mean, if a guy works as a bricklayer and he moves from Birmingham to Scotland to do a job and his wife leaves them, you don't blame the company that you work for. Whereas if it happens in the army, a guy gets posted somewhere and his wife leaves him, some of them seem to blame the army, which I don't think is fair. When did you start moving through the ranks, Peter? Because uh, a man for Glasgow to get to all the accolades that you've had, all the medals, everything. Yeah. When did you start moving through the ranks and why were you doing that? How I, you... I, I think I, I was, my, when it came to promotion, I was my own worst enemy because I was, I couldn't handle drink too well. But I was, you know what, I went to Lance Corporal, Corporal, into a fight, down to Lance Corporal. Then go to the Paris, made up to Sergeant, up to Staff Sergeant, and then I came out of the Army. And it was just a story of my life, you know. Um, I get into my, more than my, my share of problems. Um... And some of them I'd created myself, but, you know, it was a comeback from something that had happened before. Mm -hmm. Was that hard to deal with? I found it hard, yeah. I, f I found it hard to deal with it. Um, I, I don't think I even liked myself. Why do you think that was? Uh, probably something to do with my background as well. And, and I'd never experienced in my younger days is being told well done. Um, in the early days in the army, um, I felt that I was struggling all the time, which I was. I mean, the SAS course to me wasn't easy. I personally found it hard, not the physical side, the behaviour side. Do you get trained how to look, deal with your emotions to be more, I don't know if it's cold or whatever, do you get taught those things mm. in the SAS, no? They may do it nowadays, but when I was there, no. I seen a video, Peter, on YouTube. It was something to do with like mercen mercenary yeah. killings. Uh, that it uh, actually happened in Angola. And what happened? I was packed off to a place called San Antonio Desire, and I was down there. And Holden Roberto, who was the president of the FNLA, came to see me, and he says there's been a massacre done by Callan, who was the the guy in charge of the group up at McKellar and he says I want you to go and arrest him now it takes an awful lot to make me afraid but this guy was very very wary of him you know you, you just couldn't work him out you couldn't fathom him out anyway I went there and as I was coming out to coming into land some Americans that were hanging on to home Roberto had attached themselves to me and we'll give you cover and all that carry on so I seen the a vehicle with four men in it, with a machine gun on the back, coming towards the airfield. And my heart was going bump, bump, bump. And uh, we got the aircraft. And uh, 
as the jeep was coming up towards us, I noticed that the escort I had had run deserted. <laughs> They'd gone and hidden the bushes. And I often say it, as I know how Jesus felt in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, I was on my own. Anyway, Callan wasn't there. It was a guy called Sammy Copeland. So we went back to McKellar and I picked up that there had been a massacre. And I said to one of the drivers, take me to where the massacre was. And I drove up and there was a load of Europeans just lying there mowing down. They were so mercenaries. And I, I remember one guy was hanging over a bush, holding the bush. And his brains were blown out, you know, from the back. He'd been shot in the back of the head. And it made a terrible impression on me. And I looked and I went, I couldn't believe that soldiers could do that to their fellow soldiers. So I got back and I found that Callan had been captured, the guy that had organised it all. And the guy that actually did the shooting was a guy called Sammy Copeland. Now, Sammy Copeland had a... Um, a reputation of being a good soldier, but I think he'd fallen under the the spell of Callan and he was involved in this massacre. So Holden Roberto said, we've got to do something here. So I held a court of inquiry and having been in a few of those things myself in the army against me, um, I had an idea what to do. And... Uh, we got there and everybody gave evidence and nobody held anything back. They were right into what Sammy Copeland had done. At this stage, Sammy, he just lost it and he made it, he bolted for it. And one of, the, one of the firing squad that we had lined up, we sentenced him to death. One of the firing squad got him as he, he ran away and, and brought him down. And it was, it was hurtful and that Sammy was a good man. He just fell under the influence of someone else. So you had to kill them? Yeah. How was that then? When After things like that, do you just go on with it day to day, day to day no, routine? No, what I did or? is I looked at the men and I looked around them. They'd been with Callan the whole time. And who are these guys, Callan? That's people, your own men? Yeah, he was in charge. It was split into two groups when I got there. I was sent to San Antonio Desire and Callan held... Uh, a place called Michaela. Now, when I got to t San Antonio Desire, one of the guys said to me, he says, it's better you're down here, Peter. I said, why? He says, because Callan was talking about killing you. I said, why would he want to kill, kill you? He said he saw you as competition. And uh, I said, I, I just accepted it. And I got on with what I was doing. And as I say, I get called up to, to sort this lot out up there. And I, I um, landed and it was, the men were fucked. It was like I'd seen from the First World War, you know, black under the eyes and they were exhausted because they didn't know if they were going to live another day. Now, Callan, for all his fault, didn't like guts. He didn't like bottle. You know, let's get that straight. But he, there was something loose up top. And... Uh, as I say, he got captured. And they, as I say, Sammy Copeland was brought into the frame. And uh, as I say, he was executed as he ran away. And I looked at the men and I said, these guys are not capable of fighting. So I lined them all up and I said, my cousin was in that group. And I said, please reassure these men, men that it's not another hatchet man that's come on the scene. So he told them and I said, right, they're no good to you. They're, they're, they're spent, they're finished. So I just said, who wants to go home? And even then you could think, is this guy going to top us if we want to go home? It never worked out that way. So I got them and I just went, get rid of them. They're no good. They're, they've lost it. They've been bullied. They've been cajoled, terrorised into the deck. They're no good. And I sent them all home. So why was that man killing his own people? He didn't know how to handle life. He'd, he'd never been an NCO. He'd never been a leader. 
Um, but it'd be wrong to say that he he, he he didn't. Leadership to him was just do as you're told. For example, one guy turned up and must have played late and he just shot him in the back of the head. You know, and it, it was disciplined by fear as opposed to, you know, leadership. It was a shame. It really was a shame because um, it could have worked out better, but it, it just it just put the kibosh on the whole of it, you know? Mm -hmm. When did you get the call that you were wanting to kill Escobar? How does a Glasgow boy get that call to kill the biggest drug cartel well, and the biggest drug lord yeah. ever? Well, one of the guys that was in Callan's group was called Dave Tompkins. And Dave, Dave got blown up there with a Claymore mine. And he was in hospital and I went to see him. And we just st stuck... You know, we just struck a friend friendship and we always kept contact and um Dave then came up to uh, Hereford. I met him in one of the pubs there and he he says I've got a job. I says, What is it? He says, um kill Pablo Escobar and I went, Let's go for it, you know. <laughs> So how did that start then? How did the planning start from that, from England to then go to Colombia? We we flew straight to Colombia and we met up with a guy called Jorge Salcido and uh, he briefed us on what was happening and we went to see two businessmen who in reality were part of the Cali cartel. And there was an ongoing battle between the Cali cartel and the Medellin cartel and they just wanted Pablo out of the way because he was he was gunning from them because he wanted the complete show. Um, and there was also army involvement in that Jorge Salcido was a colonel in the army and there was an awful lot of liaison there, can you see it? Uh, consequently, when we went to an airport, we just walked straight through. The, you know, the, we were stamped everywhere. You were, there was no messing. Everything was laid on and done. So there was an army involvement in the background. And basically what it was, the intelligence side of the army wanted the two cartels finished. And they thought, get them battling with each other, they might wipe each other out. But it's only part of the whole scene. It was it was very deep, and um, they said um, the first part of it was getting rid of Pablo, and uh, there was no messing. You know that we said we're going to need weapons. What weapons do you want? We'll have M16s. M16s turned up. What about rocket launchers? We got the rocket launchers, pistols. You know, the whole lot, everything turned up. It was like, as I say, it was like Christmas. And we we started training. And we couldn't train, we were in Cali. So they took us to a place called Pennsylvania, which was up on the hill outside Cali. And there was a big estate there. And we just trained on the football ground and the rugby ground, uh, doing tactics, moving about, who does what, who goes where. And we, we we built a mock-up of the place just with white tape. And we just practised and practised and practised. And eventually said, well, you know, we've got to get somewhere where we can get live firing in. So they then took us to a place called La Guagua. And we um, we arrived there and it was ideal. Straight on the edge of a stream, so we had water. We had everything we needed. There was a big hut there. It was just a hut, which held a whole lot of us. And then the next thing, lo and behold, two helicopters turned up. And uh, we um, started painting them in police and army colours because Pablo had put the word out that don't shoot in army or police helicopters. Because, Why was that? Because uh, it would only bring more heat. More, more heat. And so we were using that as part of the way to get into the complex. Uh, we trained there, and we just went on and on and on. And the guy, you could see the guys gelling together, you know. And I, don't forget, I'd soldiered with these, a lot of these guys before. 
in Rhodesia in South Africa. And um, i just seen the whole thing coming together. It was just, it was, it was fitting in. And then we, we then did a, a couple of live dress rehearsals, wearing all the kit that we'd wear on the target, carrying the weapons we would uh, use on the target, fire and ammunition that we'd use on the target. And we just practised and practised. And then we got it right. So it was then a case of just warming yourself up every day, doing a bit of shooting and whatnot, getting ready for the strike. Dave Tompkins uh, had liaised with the bosses. They had a spy in Pablo's um, compound who would let them know, what, let them know when Pablo was there. So we waited for a few days and they finally got him in position. How many people were in your team, Peter? Twelve. How long does a training take for a job like that? I I had 11 weeks. And for a man that Pablo Escobar starts to be earning over 400 million a week, they say, yeah. his security must have been tight. So how does 12 guys beat security like his? Well, for a start, we'd all been fighting in Africa against greater numbers than us. Now, you, you've got to understand, a lot of his bodyguards and a lot of his security guys were just guys that run about with a magazine in their belt and carrying a newsy or some submachine gun. And we went in there, we were carrying enough ammunition to kill the best part of 3,000 men. We were tooled up to the eyeballs, plus the fact we had a helicopter gunship, which we hoped would level it all down. So the, the confidence was on our side. It was, it was never doubted by any of the men. You know... How was uh Did you not have a snitch in the camp? Was there not somebody's ass collapsed and they wanted out, but then yeah. sold the story to the press? Yeah, there was because a... it was only you and your other man who knew that yeah. Pablo, Asco, Pablo yeah. Escobar was the target. This guy, he was an Aussie guy. I, I won't say his name. He's he's dead now. Um, he first thing he, he came to me, he says, "My bottle's gone," and I says, "Yeah, okay." And what I didn't want him doing was, you know, you get a a guy there, you could keep him to the end, but he'd lower morale the reason he wasn't going and he'd feel like shit as well. So I got him out of the way. I sent him back and he was full of promises. First thing he did was what he promised not to do, went to the press. And he wanted to, he was one of these guys who wanted to be a heavy combat soldier, but not necessary in it, on the fringes of it. And he blew the gaff to the to the press and the television, but fortunately he didn't know who the target was. So it got us off the hook. And then he did an interview later on when he knew who the target was and he did a second one, you know. How's that for you, to somebody you trained and trust to then doing that? I felt he betrayed us. He betrayed us and I told him so. If you go outside there, you'll see a rifle there. He sent it on to me, a little rifle this size. And he tried to talk to me again. I says, please don't speak to me. You betrayed the guys you were working with. We could have all been killed because he wanted his ego fed. What if Pablo Escobar got wind of what you were trying to do? What would have happened? Uh, I think he'd have probably been prepared for it. Um, so, but so were we. I mean, we had everything laid on. We would you know, evacuation ships we had a Telstar up, which all our communications worked through. We had a gunship. Um, it may have gone the other way, but we were depending on the element of surprise, which we did have, because they didn't know it was coming. Was there many hits out in Pablo Escobar beforehand? I know I think somebody tried to blow up his house or his car, but yeah. was there many professional no, hits? No, no. He was doing the professional hitting. Yeah, I think this is <laughs> over 4,000 bodies he's yeah. got. Well, I wouldn't say that. I know he killed a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So how does that work then for British soldiers to be going over there to kill someone? Is that murder or is that a job or how does it work? I didn't look at it as that. I just know there was a million dollars on the guy's head put there by the Americans and the Colombians. And I think they saw it. They looked at it and said, let's suck it and see. It might save us from losing a couple of guys. How much were you getting paid to kill Pablo Escobar? You know, there was a movie made there and the men... Some of the, there was one guy claimed they were only paid 5,000 a month. I can tell you they weren't. The 5,000 was a, a down payment. Can you see that? 
And I know Dave Tompkins well, and Dave Tompkins is probably one of the straighter people I've met. And as I say, Dave's got a, a bit of a background as well, but he's he's always been totally honest with the guys. Because was someone not told if you can get Escobar's head, you would get an extra million? Yeah. Is that correct? Yes. Was that the main objective, was just to get money, get Escobar killed and then... No, we we wanted to kill Escobar. The, the head was a secondary thing, you know. you got to kill him first. So when you found out Escobar was in his target at yeah. the, the premises, what was the plan like for that day? The plan was that we'd fly up and by the time we came over, the, there was a range of mountains there. By the time we came over it, um, we were 18 kilometres away from the target. Can you see it? And it was a straight run in. But, and we, the other thing is we had to fly low and dodge everything because all of the radar operators in the Army and the Air Force were all on the payroll of Pablo. So, you know, we had to nip and dodge out and in and eventually it caused a wee bit of a crash, you know. Yeah, your helicopter crashed. Was your helicopter shot down or did it just crash? No, just we basically in the Andes you get the sun shining behind the mountains and if there's cloud on the mountains, it creates an optical illusion. Whereas you get a shadow coming down. They call it a sucker hole. And we flew into what, what we thought was a re-entrant uh, to get pushed our way through. And we just ran into the trees. And I, I, somehow I knew it was going to happen. And luckily for me, I loosened my seatbelt and I turned around to the guys in the back. I said, get yourself in the crash position. By doing that, the helicopter had turned over. The blade came through the cabin, passed me and chopped a leg off the pilot. I've chopped his leg and chopped his arm. And then a hel helicopter just went right over, smashed through the trees and bored a hole in the ground about the depth of this room. What's going through your mind then, Peter, when you're trying to get a job? You think you might be getting a million quid to them be lying in the middle of the jungle yeah, with dead bodies? I think survival can be dead. <laughs> <laughs> How many people, what was it, uh, 11 of you on the helicopter? No, there was only uh, one, two, four of us, because that was a command helicopter. Another helicopter was at the back? Yeah. Where did that go? It hovered up the top, and they went to, we had an RV over the other side of the mountain, mm -hmm. because it was a refueling point as well. So they had to go and get fuel. And, uh, and that, I get down, and it's funny, you know, like years before I'd done a combat survival course and the thing with it, the first thing that went through my head, the guys went to get out of the helicopter. I said, stop, stop. Don't get out till the blade stop because the helicopter was turning around the blade and it was chopping the ground and, and there's also the tail rotor. So that's spinning around as well. So when everything stopped, we got out. But we had a load of explosives in there as well. One of the things that came into the equation <laughs> was the fact we could have been blown up. Um, so I was badly shaken and the pilot was down there and Dave Tompkins was trying to get a drip in and I, I came down with Dave and I tried to get a drip into the guy and I said, Dave, give me the morphine. He's, he was just turning blue. I gave him a couple of cigarettes of morphine. All I did was make his death less pain, painful, you know. How was that then, seeing that as well? Do you just you're totally immune to that? Um, I think immune would be the wrong word to use. I just looked at it and, you know, these things, ha these things happen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I just looked and I went, poor old tiger, you know. So why were you left there alone? Is that not a rule to no. never leave a man behind? What, what happened? No, what happened was I didn't realise how badly injured I was because I was working on the pilot. As soon as I come up out of the hole when he died and Dave Tompkins got me out, I just sat there and I collapsed and I could feel the, the shock coming onto me. And uh, I said to Dave, get me a drip. And we couldn't get the drip in my arm, everything collapsed. So I just burst the drip open and, and, and drank it straight from the, the container. Does that work? It, it helps. But it's not as good as going into the, the vein, vein, you know. Um, and I lay there and I says, I'm not going to make it. I was in agony. And I said to Dave and the other two, I says, 
get down the bottom, get some help. And I suddenly, when I left, I suddenly realised that I'd broken one of the rules of combat survival. Someone should have stayed with me. And anyway, they went away and I said, I'm on my own. And they got me onto a ledge and I just lay there. <laughs> the pain was fucking excruciating, you know. <laughs> you know, it was just, um, it was painful. And what the guys had done, they'd brought all the bandages and whatnot from the, the medical pack, which was in the chopper, packed them all around me to sort of get some form of heat. And I lay there and uh, it was, it was just painful. And then uh, as it turned dark, you know, the men mental gymnastics come on and started thinking, you know, what the fuck am I doing here, you know? <laughs> Who did I get myself into this shit? Um, and uh, I see that the, the pain was there and I, I crawled along and I got a, a can of beans and I, I managed to get it opened and I, I ate some beans. I, I was getting some food into me and uh, I lay there and the, the next morning I could, there was a helicopter flying over the top and I went, they're trying to get me. And it was George Jorge, as I told you, but he was trying to reassure me that everything was in action, but I didn't know. I could just see the chopper. And... Uh, and I lay there that night and I was it was cold, cold. Don't forget we were 9,000 feet up. And uh, then I heard some voices coming. I didn't know if they were good guys and bad guys. All I heard was Spanish. And I went, how do you handle this? I said, if the bad guys get me, they will make my death very, very painful. So... I took a, a grenade and I pulled a pin out and I had a, a, a submachine gun and I just held it in one hand and the guys came up closer and closer and it's, he didn't see me and I stuck a machine gun in his hand and his stomach and he went, Ricardo, Ricardo, Ricardo. That was Jorge Salcedo's code name. And uh, I went, oh, so... They got around me and they said, right, we're going to get you down. I says, how far are we away? said, eight hours. So they tied, they, they chopped a tree down, no problem, cleaned all the tree off so it looked like a telegraph pole. So they, they strapped me onto the telegraph pole and they lowered it down the re-entrant and they lowered me down in a rope. <laughs> the pain <laughs> was phenomenal, you know. And then they did it all the way down. And they got us to the, the bop of the mountain. So we stopped that night. I says, how far? They said, four hours. Right? So we've been going for eight hours, you know. Anyway, um, I got there and I went, these guys are really nice guys. And the next thing I knew, they were splitting up. I had the escape money on me. They were splitting up the escape money. They'd been in my bag. <laughs> and they were in the process of robbing me. <laughs> <laughs> what happened then? Uh... I just bolted them. There was nothing I could do about mm. it. They were saving my life, you know. Mm -hmm. How much is a life worth? And uh, so we got up the next morning and we carried on. How long? Four hours. How long? Four hours. And eventually, I seen a hose pipe running down the stream. I says, we're getting near life. And there was just this little hut there. And the people were prepared for me. You know, I, I got there. And a woman came and she gave me a cup of coffee. And it was thick, thick black coffee and I just drank it. And there was a bed there, it was made out of sacking. You know, I just lay in this bed and I, you know, I passed out for maybe an hour or so. And they said, the helicopter's coming, the helicopter's coming to pick you up. The helicopter was landing on top of another hill, so I had to climb this hill. And the guy was shoving me from my back. I said, shove, shove. You know, there was nothing to hold on to. It was just a bare hill. I got to the top. They let me go and I rolled back down the hill again. <laughs> so I'm back at the bottom of the hill. I can laugh about it now, but it was, it was... When I think about it, it was funny because I was just burling around. So eventually got up. The, um, 
took me to a hospital. I got in the helicopter, they took me to a hospital. There was any amount of doctor's room and they said they wanted me out because the bandidos were looking for me. Well, they knew there was somebody injured. And uh, and I went back to Cali and uh, I got into the room and it was, it was, I just lay there for about a week and the men were awful good to bring me in tea and meals and that. But I was just completely covered in bruises, you know, and uh, and lucky enough, I never had stove chest. You know, it's where you're you, you're crashing something, and your body goes forward and it stops, but your lungs, your heart, and everything are travelling forward, and it causes a deep bruising, um, bruising, which could kill you. So I never had that, but <laughs> I was just I was it looked like I was blue, you know. <laughs> How was that feeling for? Getting a mission and failing. Um, we spoke about it, and Dave came in. I said, "Right, Dave, what's the score?" He says, "As soon as we can, we're going back." Dave was very positive, and I says, "Okay." So um, we decided to have another go. Then things were getting too hot. The the police and the army had picked up. There was all sorts of uh, accusations getting made who was behind it and they just said I think we better let you go and we came back to the UK How was that for you coming back after all that experience? I, you know I, I don't know how I felt honestly I was just glad to get back What year was this Peter? It was 92 I think And Escobar was killed 1993? 93 yeah Mm-hmm. What was your life like? How long did you stay? Were you already out the army by then? Oh, I, yeah. So this was just like a special assignment kind yeah. of thing? You know, I couldn't resist the challenge, you know. You know, they use the word mercenary, but, you know, if somebody asked me if I go at something, I would consider it. Mm -hmm. What I, year did you leave the... The army? Yeah. I left the, I left the South African army. You know, I was in the, uh, the British Rhodesian the South African army. I left there and... 84, 85. What yeah. was that like leaving, Peter? I never liked leaving, but it was it was time to leave Africa. It was folding up, and I did the right thing for my family. What was the, the biggest battle you've been in? A place called Chimoyo in Rhodesia. What was that like? Well, they parachuted 188 is on top of 5,000 men. And... Uh, it was going, it went on for two days. And there was um, quite a bit of killing went on. Uh, we had them beat because um, we'd an awful lot of assets up in the sky, you can you see, with canberras and whatnot. But there was a, there was an awful lot of ground fighting done, you know. Uh, we lost a couple of guys. Did you enjoy that though, Peter? Like the, the on the ground fighting, shootings, well, bombings. You know, any soldier who wants to be a soldier, any guy who wants to be a soldier and doesn't want to fight is in the wrong place. You know, you often hear it said, what is the job of the infantry? The infantry's job is through fire and manoeuvre to close with the enemy and kill him. Can you see that? No, I never brought those words out. It was the British Army. Now, now, if you say that, it sounds like you're some maniac. <laughs> What's yeah. that like being on the ground, Peter, when you're hearing people screaming and seeing people dying with you? Well, Is that a hard thing, though? No, I, I always felt that with me, it was, I can only speak for myself here. I, um, I was just saying, thank God it's not me. You know, it's the word God was slid in there as well, you know. Mm. <laughs> did you not say, see, when you, you crashed the helicopter while going to kill yeah. Escobar, did you not say, when you were lying there yourself, did you, were you not praying at one point? I, honestly, I, I have no, it's not a problem for me to talk about it. And I tried to make a deal with God. You know, being a good Catholic boy. <laughs> I went, God, if you get me out of this one, I'll try and be a better person. Um... It was a, it was, I think it was the beginning of me coming to terms with myself. You know, the people could say, you know, he, he, the final thing was 
on the mountain. In actual fact, it wasn't. It was in a pub. What happened? I seen a lot of people drinking. It was at a funeral. And everybody was turning nasty. And I used to love drinking. I loved it. And I just looked and I went, this is not for me anymore. And I just put the glass down. And I walked away. And there was no struggle. There was no shakes. And like, you know how you see these stories about guys with drink problems. Um, I just stopped. And before I knew where I was, I chalked up a year, two year. I think I'm into nine years now. Um, and I found, I found it with the pubs and the alcohol being out of the way. I was getting more clarity in my thought and my mind. Um, there was a, and an awful lot of introspection went on, you know. Um, and now I look back, I've had broken marriages. You know, I've been locked up. I've made an awful lot of mistakes in my life. But to be here where I am today, they only contributed towards it. For example, I got locked up once. And the, I don't think, you know, if I could meet the judges that sent me away, I'd shake his hand. And I'll tell you why. I don't think it was a thing, that, get this thug off the streets. I think it was a case of, get this man some thinking time. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. And I, um, it made me think got me interested in other things because I had to was, the things that I liked in life at that time was womanising and drinking so uh, it, it made me it straightened me out an awful lot and then when the final crunch came at that funeral it just never bothered me anymore and to be where I am today I feel fantastic, I live in a little flat I'm happy with my neighbours and I, I get on well with most people. It's a fantastic feeling. What do you think you were battling with? Myself. Was it? Just pain in the my past, biggest trauma? Enemy, my biggest enemy was a guy called Peter McAleese. The man in the mirror? The man in the mirror. And how was um, going through all that? Because I know you've been in Russia as well, Peter, is that correct? Yeah. What was that like? I really enjoyed Russia. You know Why? They, um, because... It's a place that was out of bounds to us. Can you see it? And I got there and there were certain things I couldn't understand. Like people that are drinking at 10 o'clock in the morning. And we had two guys who used to look after the ranges. Now in the British Army, and they were retired soldiers, in the British Army, the guy who normally looks after the ranges is a retired soldier, exactly the same, but maybe a sergeant or sergeant major's rank. In Russia, these guys were colonels. One of them had flown a Yak bomber, you know, the fighter bombers. And they were they were there. And I was really taken by these guys. And the one that um, that had been in the infantry, he says, oh, it, it, when, it, when Germany surrendered, I thought it was great. You know, it's, we're going to get home. He says, they shipped them to the other side of the country to go and fight the Japanese. Um, and I, I really enjoyed the company. So I bought them... Uh, a big, massive bottle of vodka. Um, and they don't talk about the Second World War. They talk about the Great Patriotic War. And this bottle had been specially made for it. It was a two-litre bottle. So I took it and I said, thank you very much. Don't off it. Go, 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 go. Straight away, you know. They just downed the, the vodka. And then they went, come on. You give somebody a bottle of vodka, you've got to have a drink of it yourself, you know. And I've never been one for drinking in the morning, but... I says, I better do it in case I upset them, you know. Did you ever go back home? See, that once you were in the SES, being one of, out of, just being the four who passed, did you ever go back home and get the praise? Or was the people happy for you? Was it sad? What, how was people treat you? I went back there and it was funny. I bought this Volvo and uh, I went back to Shettleson and the guys in the pub go, were going, Peter Mackley's turned up a big fucking massive car you know it was a Volvo um, he's doing well for his sale what, what's good you know and uh, and I, I, I felt good about it so I then went out to see my mate in Easter House and uh, he's dead now so um, and you know how you get nameplates on your door in Glasgow 
he didn't have a nameplate, he didn't an envelope that had been posted to him with two pins in it, you know. And I'm come on in, Peter MacLeese, have a fucking drink, you know, it was real jock stuff. And by the way, my big car, I get there and the sweet boy comes up. Hey, mister. I says, I can I look after your car. You know, stand there with one of those can openers ready to scratch it. <laughs> I says, yes. <laughs> How was yeah. your relationship with your dad while going through all this, Peter? He, according to what my sisters say, he was always checking up me. I think Peter's there. Peter's in Rhodesia and he'd, he'd look at things, but he just couldn't bring himself to ask me anything. Can you see it? To tell you that he loved you or tell you he was proud no, of never, you? It just, it wasn't in him. I think my sister puts it better than me. I... I I was just a guy, I, I, I just packed my bags and went. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what it was. I, I, I don't know why he couldn't do it. But I learned an awful lot from my father. One, I've never beat my children. Two, you know, I think, think about things beforehand. Like I remember once uh, I, I was told to smack my son and I went, no. I can't do it. He'd been naughty, but I couldn't bring myself to do it because with my dad, he got beaten first and then the inquiry came later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do you think that's what fueled you to have a lot of fights and anger at your younger years and going through life? I, I think maybe it's so easy to blame something. Uh, I think it contributed towards it, yeah. But um, it was just the way people were in Glasgow. I mean, has it changed any? I don't know. Nah, it's still quite a tough place. I think it's calmed down a lot more. Yeah. It was a murder capital Europe for a long time and then yeah. obviously it changed, knife crime came down. I think, I don't know, I think people, it's just tiring being angry all the time. It's tiring yeah. being full of fucking violence and hate oh, and rage. You know, I, I, I used to go into pubs and all of a sudden the pub wouldn't have, wouldn't have anybody in it. And it was nothing to do with me being tough. It was to do with people saying, do I really need to drink alongside this maniac? Can you see, so they would just go somewhere else. How did your book No Mean Soldier come about, Peter? Um, a guy called Mark Bless, that's his, his pen name, um, approached me, I was in Hereford for the weekend, and he says, I'd like to write a book with you. And we just, we... we developed a friendship and writing the book it was some of the most fun I've ever had because I was still drinking at the time and one day <laughs> we drunk nine bottles of wine we were sitting there and he'd say right Pierre what happened then uh, and I'd, <coughs> I'd tell him about a certain character in Panama and he'd come across with this glass with an umbrella in it you know and he'd say yes yeah, so and so and so sleeves rolled up Crockett's to Miami Vice style. I went, yeah, he knew he, and he'd get me going. And uh, I'd wake up in the morning, Mark was lying on the floor and uh, I, I was lying like that. And I think what I'd done, I'd pushed over a bottle of wine and it was a bottle falling that woke me up, you know. <laughs> and to use the joxy and I had a mouth on me like a badger's bum, you know. <laughs> What's the name No Mean Soldier come from? The No... People often ask me this, and but you get the scathing type. You no know, I mean, who does he think he is? And that's your fact. It comes from the Bible. And uh, St. Paul um, was getting interrogated by the Romans, and they said, who are you? He says, I'm Paul, a citizen of Tarsus, no mean city. Now, in 1935, there's two guys, their name escapes me at the moment, wrote a book about Glasgow and the garbles and the areas and what what went on and they called the book No Mean City. So no mean no mean soldier just means a soldier from Glasgow. It doesn't mean to say I'm a mean bastard. I would say you're mate, you're <laughs> fucking you can tell that you're the kind of guy who would follow orders from you. You can tell yeah. that there's there's no many made like that, like yeah. who can block out what you've went through and what yeah. you've what you've done that like, and just still kick on and still be yeah. laughing and thinking, would well, you know what? Fuck it. It's yeah. life. You 
took that on to join the army and you followed everything by yeah. the book and done what you could to be the best soldier yeah. that you could be. And that takes a lot of fucking yeah. courage. Everybody sees war differently, but you were there to do yeah. what you wanted to do and, and how it was. What's your worst experience, Peter? In the army? Yeah. Um, I think army-wise, the, the worst experience I had was being on the hill when I crashed. Army-wise, it was me and a guy who will call the, the posh jock because I'm not allowed to use his name. And we were... We jumped into a place uh, called Tembe, right up in the Mozambique, the other side of Lake uh, Kaborabasa. And we jumped in, and this guy had his pin down in the trench. And he was up on a hill, there was a hill behind us. And if we'd have stood, sat that way, he'd have got us, so we sat this way and curled our knees up in the top of the trench. He was shooting, shooting away at the top of the trench, and I went, oh, fuck. Just, you know, I said, I'm going to get this bastard, Steve. He said, stay where you are. This chap knows what he's doing, you know. Anyway, we stayed there and it calmed down. So some of the squadron had come up level with us. And we got out and this guy started on us again. By this time, Steve hung back. The whole place was ablaze, the whole camp. And Steve hung back in the, snow, the smoke, trying to get him, but he couldn't get him, you know. What's your best experience? For excitement. Yeah, just for in general, you think I'm living or I'm doing well for myself or a moment that you felt proud or happy? My first operational parachute jump. Yeah. Or my second, sorry. Mm -hmm. It was at Chamoyo. Why not the first? The first one was a, an insertion mm -hmm. at night time. It was a free fall insertion. Um, and the second, the second, no, it was the third one. We jumped into Chamoyo. And as, as we were flying in, there was an awful lot of flight coming up at the aircraft. And the pilots just kept on theirs and kept on going. And I went, I said to myself, Peter, this is the ultimate test. This is what you've wanted to do all your life, is to jump into action. And I'm not exaggerating, that's what I genuinely felt. Because we, the briefing we'd had was outstanding. The preparation we had was outstanding. You know, we, we when we jumped in there, we were getting in there to destroy the enemy. Can you see it? It was there was no, there was no ifs or buts about it, and there was a confidence there with the squadron. What do you think your wars and conflicts now, Peter? They don't solve anything. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you've learned all the years, all the battles and conflicts you've done? That they don't solve a thing. These place places are still at war. Aye. <laughs> if you looking back at it all, would you change anything? Sitting here today, no, because my my army career wasn't all blood and guts. I mean, I made some mistakes in the army. Um, like what? Um, well, I got to the Rhodesian army and I, I laid into a sergeant one day and I, I, I had to do it because my pride was on the line and I got locked up for it. Um... And I just looked and I said to myself, you know, I'd been, I, I would have been as well leaving then. Can you see it? Because um, I just, I just never featured as well as I could have done or should have done. Can you see it? Because I was worried about getting things wrong all the time or saying something wrong. You know. How does it affect family life, Peter? Going through like war zones and battling and all the all the time. Well, I was I was very lucky. I had a good army wife, and she stuck by me all the time. I was talking earlier on to to you, and I was running through a camp in in Angola, and there was bullets flying all over the place, and I went. Jane made this possible. She never, ever messed about with my head in the army. And on the same trip, I'd seen a big paratrooper coming into the office, and he was, he was, he was finished. His wife had been messed about. He found out about it, and he was just... It he, he just wasn't there anymore, can you see it? Mm -hmm. Does that happen a lot, though, that really fuck with men's mindsets if they're going into war and they find out their missus is cheating or some sort of pain back well, well, there's home? No 
there's nothing you can do about it mm -hmm. because you're there and you can't do anything until you get back. And it's, it's gnawing at you all the, t all the time. What if, if you were back at home, you could either talk the thing over with her, with a person and call it quits. Can you see it? Or, or call it quits. What do you miss the most, Peter? Comradeship. The brotherhood? Aye, and the men. I mean, I'd, I when I was sat major the parachute, uh, the Pathfinders, excuse me, <coughs> When I was they sent me the path the most rewarding job I ever had. They were up to everything. You know, they'd pull any strokes they could, but when it came to the reckoning, they were always there. Do you feel as if you're looked after, after everything you've been through once you came out of the army? No. <laughs> Why is that? Uh, um, the, the armies, the British armies, it's not geared along those lines. It's not like other armies. I mean, all you got to do is look at the streets here. There's guys sleeping on the streets. They can say, well, he, he turned to the drink, so and so and so and so. And they, they can use all the excuses they want. The fact is, they're not too kind to their own after they leave. And that's what I genuinely feel. It's never happened to me. But, I, you know, when I see these guys, I, I... But, again, there's an element within them is out to get what they can out of the army. But the army judges everybody that's out on on that small element. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. And I feel that they could look after their ex-soldiers a bit more. I'm not saying Molly cuddle them. Um, I feel they could make a greater contribution. Yeah, because we do a lot of homeless work in Glasgow and a lot as ex-forces yeah. and it's sad because... They just don't know how to deal with it. Some just fell off in their luck yeah. and just, it's difficult to get back. But if you're willing to fight for yeah. someone, then if people are willing to go to war for yeah. whatever, then they should be willing to See, fight for them when they come back. I, I spoke, we spoke earlier on about it. See a guy's working in a building site or he's a brickie or he's a painter, or he's something, and he's working at home. And then all of a sudden, he goes to do, do a job in Scotland and he's misses goes astray or has an affair with someone else. He doesn't turn around and blame his employer, does he? The employer's got nothing to do. He's only the guy that gave him the job. But people tend to blame it on the army. And I think this is totally unfair. Because the women know what they're getting themselves into. And the men should get them mentally prepared for when they come in. Um, so you get a lot of guys here. I was watching telly one night with my son. And there was a guy there with the bottom lip trembling, you know. And my wife left me. I says, he's, he's, before he said it, I says, his wife's left him. And the sob story comes along, going to bed at night, for, at night with a knife by his side. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I, I, I take myself as the average soldier. And if anything else, maybe I've been blessed. I don't know. Do you miss it? Yes. <laughs> it was a sense of purpose. You know, honour, devotion to duty, mm -hmm. loyalty, you know. Um, it may not always get carried out in the army, but there's a code of honour there. Can you see it? People break that code of honour. I'm not saying they don't, but at least there's a code. Going forward for the future, Peter, what's your plans? What do you see yourself doing? You're going to be doing talks, another book, possibly a film? Um, I'd like to write another book. Um... And I'd love to do some talks. I've done a few up until now. And uh, they've been fairly successful. But I, I'm very bad at... I'm not good at peddling myself. You know, I'm not, I'm not a good salesman of myself. <laughs> but things like this help. And obviously with a documentary, The Killing of Escobar. Yeah. Paul Donnelly, who played your part. I know Paul well. He's yeah. a family friend for over 20 years. Paul actually done me a few favours when he was a bouncer back in the day. He helped yeah. us out a lot. Yeah. Like, that's a great documentary this will even being on here today will open up doors for people wanting to get involved in things it's um you're a great speaker clearly lived the life clearly no fucking about with you is uh, like i said like i'd imagine people would respect you highly in the army and stuff like if you said something then yeah. it would have to get done or else i don't think you'd have took that lightly and i was i was very fortunate i had a sergeant major when I was in the British Army, who was, I can only describe him as an out-and-out -out bastard. 
And I said to myself, if I ever get in that position, I will never treat men like that. And I never. And very fortunately, I could always persuade the men to get things done. And as I say, I, I, the the Pathfinders, they were wild. They did all the, you know, the, some of the things were appalling to, to the South African army, but they weren't scared of a fight, you know. Just before we finish up, do you have any regrets, Peter? Not one. <laughs> Listen, for coming on today and telling your story, I thoroughly enjoyed that and all the best for the future, Peter. Thank you very much. Take care. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.